Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe Chapter Twenty Eight Reunion Week after week glided away in the St. Clair mansion, and the waves of life settled back to their usual flow, where that little bark had gone down. For how imperiously, how coolly, in disregard of all one's feeling, does the hard, cold, uninteresting course of daily realities move on. Still must we eat and drink, and sleep, and wake again. Still bargain, buy, sell, ask, and answer questions. Pursue, in short, a thousand shadows, though all interest them be over. The cold mechanical habit of living remaining after all vital interest in it has fled. All the interests and hopes of St. Clair's life had unconsciously wound themselves around this child. It was for Eva that he had managed his property. It was for Eva that he had planned the disposal of his time. And to do this and that for Eva, to buy, improve, alter, and arrange, or dispose something for her, had been so long his habit that now she was gone there seemed nothing to be thought of, and nothing to be done. True, there was another life, a life which, once believed in, stands as a solemn, significant figure before the otherwise unmeaning ciphers of time, changing them to orders of mysterious, untold value. St. Clair knew this well, and often, in many a weary hour, he heard that slender childish voice calling him to the skies, and saw that little hand pointing to him the way of life. But a heavy lethargy of sorrow lay on him. He could not arise. He had one of those natures which could better and more clearly conceive of religious things, from its own perceptions and instincts, than many a matter-of-fact and practical Christian. The gift to appreciate and the sense to feel the finer shades and relations of moral things often seems an attribute of those whose whole life shows a careless disregard of them. Hence Moore, Byron, Goethe often speak words more wisely descriptive of the true religious sentiment than another man whose whole life is governed by it. In such minds disregard of religion is a more fearful treason, a more deadly sin. St. Clair had never pretended to govern himself by any religious obligation, and a certain fineness of nature gave him such an instinctive view of the extent of the requirements of Christianity, that he shrank, by anticipation, from what he felt would be the exactions of his own conscience, if he once did resolve to assume them. For so inconsistent is human nature, especially in the ideal, that not to undertake a thing at all seems better than to undertake and come short. Still, St. Clair was, in many respects, another man. He read his little Eva's Bible seriously and honestly. He thought more soberly and practically of his relations to his servants, enough to make him extremely dissatisfied with both his past and present course. And one thing he did, soon after his return to New Orleans, and that was to commence the legal steps necessary to Tom's emancipation which was to be perfected as soon as he could get through the necessary formalities. Meantime he attached himself to Tom more and more every day. In all the wide world there was nothing that seemed to remind him so much of Eva, and he would insist on keeping him constantly about him, and, fastidious and unapproachable as he was with regard to his deeper feelings, he almost thought aloud to Tom. Nor would any one have wondered at it, who had seen the expression of affection and devotion with which Tom continually followed his young master. "'Well, Tom,' said St. Clair, the day after he had commenced the legal formalities for his enfranchisement, "'I'm going to make a free man of you, so have your trunk packed, and get ready to set out for Kentuck.' The sudden light of joy that shone in Tom's face as he raised his hands to heaven, his emphatic, "'Bless the Lord!' rather discomposed St. Clair. He did not like it that Tom should be so ready to leave him. "'You haven't had such very bad times here, that you need be in such a rapture, Tom,' he said dryly. "'No, no, Massa, tain't that. It's being a free man. That's what I'm joined for.' "'Why, Tom, don't you think, for your own part, you've been better off than to be free?' "'No, indeed, Massa St. Clair.' said Tom, with a flash of energy. "'No, indeed!' 
Why, Tom, you couldn't possibly have earned by your work such clothes and such living as I have given you. Knows all that, Massa St. Clair. Massa's been too good, but Massa, I'd rather have poor clothes, poor house, poor everything and have em mine, than have the best and have em any man's else. I had so, Massa. I think it's nature, Massa. I suppose so, Tom. And you'll be going off and leaving me in a month or so he added rather discontentedly. Though why you shouldn't, no mortal knows, he said in a gayer tone, and getting up he began to walk the floor. Not while Massa is in trouble, said Tom. I'll stay with Massa as long as he wants me, so as I can be any use. Not while I'm in trouble, Tom, said St. Clair, looking sadly out of the window. And when will my trouble be over? When Massa St. Clair is a Christian, said Tom. "'And you really mean to stay by till that day comes?' said St. Clair, half-smiling, as he turned from the window and laid his hand on Tom's shoulder. "'Ah, Tom, you soft, silly boy! I won't keep you till that day. Go home to your wife and children, and give my love to all.' "'As faith to believe that day will come,' said Tom earnestly, and with tears in his eyes. "'The Lord has work for Massa.' "'A work, hey?' said St. Clair. "'Well, now, Tom, give me your views on what sort of a work it is. Let's hear.' "'Why, even a poor fellow like me has a work from the Lord. And Massa St. Clair, that has a larnin' and riches and friends, how much he might do for the Lord.' "'Tom, you seem to think the Lord needs a great deal done for him,' said St. Clair, smiling. "'We does for the Lord when we does for his critters,' said Tom. "'Good theology, Tom.' "'Better than Dr. B. preaches, I dare swear,' said St. Clair. The conversation was here interrupted by the announcement of some visitors. Marie St. Clair felt the loss of Eva as deeply as she could feel anything, and, as she was a woman that had a great faculty of making everybody unhappy, when she was, her immediate attendants had still stronger reason to regret the loss of their young mistress, whose winning ways and gentle intercessions had so often been a shield to them from the tyrannical and selfish exactions of her mother. Poor old Mammy, in particular, whose heart, severed from all normal domestic ties, had consoled itself with this one beautiful being, was almost heartbroken. She cried day and night, and was, from excess of sorrow, less skilful and alert in her ministrations of her mistress than usual, which drew down a constant storm of invectives on her defenceless head. Miss Ophelia felt the loss, but in her good and honest heart it bore fruit unto everlasting life. She was more softened, more gentle, and though equally assiduous in every duty, it was with a chastened and quiet air, as one who communed with her own heart not in vain. She was more diligent in teaching Topsy, taught her mainly from the Bible, did not any longer shrink from her touch, or manifest an ill-repressed disgust, because she felt none. She viewed her now through the softened medium that Eva's hand had first held before her eyes, and saw in her only an immortal creature, whom God had sent to be led by her to glory and virtue. Topsy did not become at once a saint, but the life and death of Eva did work a marked change in her. The callous indifference was gone. There was now sensibility, hope, desire, and the striving for good, a strife irregular, interrupted, suspended oft, but yet renewed again. One day, when Topsy had been sent for by Miss Ophelia, she came hastily, thrusting something into her bosom. "'What you doin' there, you limb? You have been stealin' something, I'll be bound,' said the imperious little Rosa, who had been sent to call her, seizing her at the same time roughly by the arm. "'You go long, Miss Rosa,' said Topsy, pulling from her. "'Tain't none of your business.' "'None of your sass,' said Rosa. "'I saw you hiding something. I know your tricks.' And Rosa seized her arm, and tried to force her hand into her bosom, while Topsy, enraged, kicked and fought valiantly for what she considered her rights. The clamor and confusion of the battle drew Miss Ophelia and St. Clair both to the spot. "'She's been stealing,' said Rosa. "'I ain't neither,' vociferated Topsy, sobbing with passion. "'Give me that, whatever it is,' said Miss Ophelia firmly. Topsy hesitated, but on a second order pulled out of her bosom a little parcel done up in the foot of one of her own old stockings. Miss Ophelia turned it out. There was a small book which had been given to Topsy by Eva, containing a single verse of scripture arranged for every day in the year. 
and in a paper the curl of hair that she had given her on that memorable day when she had taken her last farewell. St. Clair was a good deal affected at the sight of it. The little book had been rolled in a long strip of black crepe torn from the funeral weeds. "'What did you wrap this round the book for?' said St. Clair, holding up the crepe. "'Cause, cause, cause t'was Miss Eva. Oh, don't take him away, please!' she said, and, sitting flat down on the floor, and putting her apron over her head, she began to sob vehemently. It was a curious mixture of the pathetic and the ludicrous, the little old stockings, black crape, textbook, fair, soft curl, and Topsy's utter distress. St. Clair smiled, but there were tears in his eyes as he said, "'Come, come, don't cry. You shall have them.' And putting them together, he threw them into her lap, and drew Miss Ophelia with him into the parlour. "'I really think you can make something of that concern,' he said, pointing with his thumb backward over his shoulder. "'Any mind that is capable of a real sorrow is capable of good. You must try and do something with her.' "'The child has improved greatly,' said Miss Ophelia. "'I have great hopes of her. But, Augustine,' she said, laying her hand on his arm, "'one thing I want to ask. Whose is this child to be? Yours or mine?' "'Why, I gave her to you,' said Augustine. "'But not legally. I want her to be mine legally,' said Miss Ophelia. "'Phew, cousin,' said Augustine. "'What will the Abolition Society think?' They'll have a day of fasting appointed for this backsliding, if you become a slaveholder. Oh, nonsense! I want her mine, that I may have a right to take her to the free states, and give her her liberty, that all I am trying to do be not undone. Oh, cousin, what an awful doin' evil that good may come! I can't encourage it. I don't want you to joke, but to reason, said Miss Ophelia. There is no use in my trying to make this child a Christian child, unless I save her from all the chances and reverses of slavery. And, if you really are willing I should have her, I want you to give me a deed of gift, or some legal paper." "'Well, well,' said St. Clair, "'I will,' and he sat down and unfolded a newspaper to read. "'But I want it done now,' said Miss Ophelia. "'What's your hurry?' "'Because now is the only time there ever is to do a thing in,' said Miss Ophelia. "'Come, now, here's paper, pen, and ink. Just write a paper.' St. Clair, like most men of his class of mind, cordially hated the present tense of action generally, and therefore he was considerably annoyed by Miss Ophelia's downrightedness. "'Why, what's the matter?' said he. "'Can't you take my word? One would think you had taken lessons of the Jews coming at a fellow so.' "'I want to make sure of it,' said Miss Ophelia. "'You may die, or fail, and—' Then Topsy be hustled off to auction, spite of all I can do. Really, you are quite provident. Well, seeing I'm in the hands of a Yankee, there is nothing for it but to concede. And St. Clair rapidly wrote off a deed of gift, which, as he was well versed in the forms of law, he could easily do, and signed his name to it in sprawling capitals, concluding by a tremendous flourish. There! Isn't that black and white now, Miss Vermont? he said, as he handed it to her. "'Good boy,' said Miss Ophelia, smiling. "'But must it not be witnessed?' "'No bother, yes. Here,' he said, opening the door into Marie's apartment. "'Marie, cousin wants your autograph. Just put your name down here.' "'What's this?' said Marie, as she ran over the paper. "'Ridiculous! I thought cousin was too pious for such horrid things,' she added, as she carelessly wrote her name. But if she has a fancy for that article, I am sure she's welcome. There, now she's yours, body and soul, said St. Clair, handing the paper. No more mine now than she was before, said Miss Ophelia. Nobody but God has a right to give her to me, but I can protect her now. Well, she's yours by a fiction of law, then, said St. Clair, as he turned back into the parlour and sat down to his paper. Miss Ophelia, who seldom sat much in Marie's company, followed him into the parlour, having first carefully laid away the paper. "'Augustine,' she said suddenly, as she sat knitting, "'have you ever made any provision for your servants in case of your death?' "'No,' said St. Clair, as he read on. "'Then all your indulgence to them may prove a great cruelty by and by.' St. Clair had often thought the same thing himself, but he answered negligently, "'Well, I mean to make a provision by and by.' "'When?' said Miss Ophelia. 
Oh, one of these days. What if you should die first? Cousin, what's the matter? said St. Clair, laying down his paper and looking at her. Do you think I show symptoms of yellow fever or cholera, that you are making post-mortem arrangements with such zeal? In the midst of life we are in death, said Miss Ophelia. St. Clair rose up, and laying the paper down carelessly, walked to the door that stood open on the veranda, to put an end to a conversation that was not agreeable to him. Mechanically he repeated the last word again, Death! And as he leaned against the railings, and watched the sparkling water as it rose and fell in the fountain, and, as in a dim and dizzy haze, saw flowers and trees and vases of the courts, he repeated again the mystic word so common in every mouth, yet of such fearful power, DEATH. Strange that there should be such a word, he said, and such a thing, and we ever forget it, that one should be living, warm and beautiful, full of hopes, desires and wants, one day, and the next be gone, utterly gone, and for ever. It was a warm and golden evening, and as he walked to the other end of the veranda he saw Tom busily intent on his Bible, pointing, as he did so, with his finger, to each successive word, and whispering them to himself with an earnest air. "'Want me to read to you, Tom?' said St. Clair, seating himself carelessly by him. "'If Massa pleases,' said Tom gratefully. "'Massa makes it so much plainer.' St. Clair took the book and glanced at the place, and began reading one of the passages which Tom had designated by the heavy marks around it. It ran as follows. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all His holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. And before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats, St. Clair read on in an animated voice, till he came to the last of the verses. Then shall the King say unto him on his left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. I was sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they answer unto him, Lord, when saw we thee an hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he say unto them, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these my brethren, ye did it not to me. St. Clair seemed struck with this last passage, for he read it twice, the second time, slowly, and as if he were revolving the words in his mind. Tom, he said, these folks that get such hard measure seem to have been doing just what I have, living good, easy, respectable lives, and not troubling themselves to inquire how many of their brethren were hungry, or athirst, or sick, or in prison. Tom did not answer. St. Clair rose up and walked thoughtfully up and down the veranda, seeming to forget everything in his own thoughts. So absorbed was he, that Tom had to remind him twice that the tea-bell had rung, before he could get his attention. St. Clair was absent and thoughtful all tea-time. After tea, he and Marie and Miss Ophelia took possession of the parlor almost in silence. Marie disposed herself on a lounge, under a silken mosquito-curtain, and was soon sound asleep. Miss Ophelia silently busied herself with her knitting. St. Clair sat down to the piano, and began playing a soft and melancholy movement, with the Aeolian accompaniment. He seemed in a deep reverie, and to be soliloquizing to himself by music. After a little he opened one of the drawers, took out an old music-book whose leaves were yellow with age, and began turning it over. "'There,' he said to Miss Ophelia, "'this was one of my mother's books, and here is her handwriting. Come and look at it.' She copied and arranged this Mozart's Requiem. Miss Ophelia came accordingly. "'It was something she used to sing often,' said St. Clair. "'I think I can hear her now.' He struck a few majestic chords, and began singing that grand old Latin piece, the Dies Irae. Tom, who was listening in the outer veranda, was drawn by the sound to the very door, where he stood earnestly. He did not understand the words, of course, but the music and manner of singing appeared to affect him strongly, especially when St. Clair sang the more pathetic parts. Tom would have sympathized more heartily if he had known the meaning of the beautiful words. Recordare Jesu Pie 
quod sum causa tuar viae, ne me perdas ila die. Querens me sedisti lasus, reme misti crucem passus, tantus laor non sit casus. These lines have been thus rather inadequately translated. Think, O Jesus, for what reason thou endurest earth's spite and treason, nor me lose in that dread season. Seeking me, thy womb feet hasted, on the cross thy soul death tasted. Let not all these toils be wasted. Mrs. Stowe's Note St. Clair threw a deep and pathetic expression into the words, for the shadowy veil of years seemed drawn away, and he seemed to hear his mother's voice leading his. Voice and instrument seemed both living, and threw out with vivid sympathy those strange which the ethereal Mozart first conceived as his own dying requiem. When St. Clair had done singing, he sat leaning his head upon his hand a few moments, and then began walking up and down the floor. What a sublime conception is that of a last judgment, said he, a righting of all the wrongs of ages, a solving of all moral problems by an unanswerable wisdom. It is, indeed, a wonderful image. It is a fearful one to us, said Miss Ophelia. It ought to be to me, I suppose, said St. Clair, stopping thoughtfully. I was reading to Tom this afternoon that chapter in Matthew that gives an account of it, and I have been quite struck with it. One should have expected some terrible enormities charged to those who are excluded from heaven as the reason, but no, they are condemned for not doing positive good, as if that included every possible harm. Perhaps, said Miss Ophelia, it is impossible for a person who does no good not to do harm. And what, said St. Clair, speaking abstractly, but with deep feeling, what shall be said of one whose own heart, whose education, and the wants of society have called in vain to some noble purpose, who has floated on a dreamy, neutral spectator of the struggles, agonies, and wrongs of man, when he should have been a worker. "'I should say,' said Miss Ophelia, "'that he ought to repent, and begin now.' "'All was practical and to the point,' said St. Clair, his face breaking out into a smile. "'You never leave me any time for general reflections, cousin. You always bring me short up against the actual present. You have a kind of eternal now always in your mind. Now is all the time I have anything to do with," said Miss Ophelia. Dear little Eva, poor child, said St. Clair, she had set her little simple soul on a good work for me. It was the first time since Eva's death that he had ever said as many words as these to her, and he spoke now evidently repressing very strong feeling. My view of Christianity is such, he added, that I think no man can consistently profess it without throwing the whole weight of his being against this monstrous system of injustice that lies at the foundation of all our society, and, if need be, sacrificing himself in the battle. That is, I mean that I could not be a Christian otherwise, though I have certainly had intercourse with a great many enlightened and Christian people who did no such thing and I confess that the apathy of religious people on this subject, their want of perception of wrongs that filled me with horror, have engendered in me more skepticism than any other thing. "'If you knew all this,' said Miss Ophelia, "'why didn't you do it?' "'Oh, because I have had only that kind of benevolence which consists in lying on a sofa and cursing the church and clergy for not being martyrs and confessors. One can see, you know, very easily how others ought to be martyrs. "'Well, are you going to do differently now?' said Miss Ophelia. "'God only knows the future,' said St. Clair. "'I am braver than I was, because I have lost all, and he who has nothing to lose can afford all risks. And what are you going to do?' "'My duty, I hope, to the poor and lowly, as fast as I find it out,' said St. Clair beginning with my own servants, for whom I have yet done nothing, and perhaps at some future day it may appear that I can do something for a whole class, something to save my country from the disgrace of that false position in which she now stands before all civilized nations. "'Do you suppose it possible that a nation ever will voluntarily emancipate?' said Miss Ophelia. 
"'I don't know,' said St. Clair. "'This is a day of great deeds. Heroism and disinterestedness are rising up here and there in the earth. The Hungarian nobles set free millions of serfs at an immense pecuniary loss, and perhaps among us may be found generous spirits who do not estimate honor and justice by dollars and cents.' "'I hardly think so,' said Miss Ophelia. "'But suppose we should rise up to-morrow and emancipate. Who would educate these millions, and teach them how to use their freedom? They never would rise to do much among us. The fact is, we are too lazy and unpractical ourselves, ever to give them much of an idea of that industry and energy which is necessary to form them into men. They will have to go north, where labor is the fashion, and universal custom. And tell me now, is there enough Christian philanthropy among your northern states to bear with the process of their education and elevation? You send thousands of dollars to foreign missions, but could you endure to have the heathen sent into your towns and villages, and give your time and thoughts and money to raise them to the Christian standard? That's what I want to know. If we emancipate, are you willing to educate? How many families in your town would take a negro man and woman, teach them, bear with them, and seek to make them Christians? How many merchants would take Adolf if I wanted to make him a clerk? or mechanics, if I wanted him taught a trade. If I wanted to put Jane and Rosa to a school, how many schools are there in the northern states that would take them in? How many families that would board them? And yet they are as white as many a woman, north or south. You see, cousin, I want justice done us. We are in a bad position. We are the more obvious oppressors of the negro, but the unchristian prejudice of the north is an oppressor almost equally severe. "'Well, cousin, I know it is so,' said Miss Ophelia. "'I know it was so with me, till I saw that it was my duty to overcome it. But I trust I have overcome it, and I know there are many good people at the North, who in this matter need only to be taught what their duty is to do it. It would certainly be a greater self-denial to receive heathen among us than to send missionaries to them, but I think we should do it.' "'You would, I know,' said St. Clair. I'd like to see anything you wouldn't do, if you thought it your duty." "'Well, I'm not uncommonly good,' said Miss Ophelia. "'Others would, if they saw things as I do. I intend to take Topsy home when I go. I suppose our folks will wonder at first, but I think they will be brought to see as I do. Besides, I know there are many people at the North who do exactly what you said.' "'Yes, but they are a minority. And if we should begin to emancipate to any extent, we should soon hear from you.' Miss Ophelia did not reply. There was a pause of some moments, and St. Clair's countenance was overcast by a sad, dreamy expression. "'I don't know what makes me think of my mother so much to-night,' he said. "'I have a strange kind of feeling, as if she were near me. I keep thinking of things she used to say. Strange what brings these past things so vividly back to us sometimes.' St. Clair walked up and down the room for some minutes more, and then said, I believe I'll go down street a few moments, and hear the news to-night." He took his hat and passed out. Tom followed him to the passage, out of the court, and asked if he should attend him. "'No, my boy,' said St. Clair. "'I shall be back in an hour.' Tom sat down in the veranda. It was a beautiful moonlight evening, and he sat watching the rising and falling spray of the fountain, and listening to its murmur. Tom thought of his home, and that he should soon be a free man and able to return to it at will. He thought how he should work to buy his wife and boys. He felt the muscles of his brawny arms with a sort of joy as he thought they would soon belong to himself, and how much they could do to work out the freedom of his family. Then he thought of his noble young master, and, ever second to that, came the habitual prayer that he had always offered for him. And then his thoughts passed on to the beautiful Eva, whom he now thought of among the angels and he thought till he almost fancied that that bright face and golden hair were looking upon him out of the spray of the fountain. And, so musing, he fell asleep, and dreamed he saw her coming bounding towards him, just as she used to come, with a wreath of jessamine in her hair, her cheeks bright, and her eyes radiant with delight. But as he looked, she seemed to rise from the ground, her cheeks wore a paler hue, her eyes had a deep divine radiance, a golden halo seemed round her head, and she vanished from his sight, 
and Tom was awakened by a loud knocking and a sound of many voices at the gate. He hastened to undo it, and, with smothered voices and heavy tread, came several men bringing a body wrapped in a cloak and lying on a shutter. The light of the lamp fell full on the face, and Tom gave a wild cry of amazement and despair that rung through all the galleries as the men advanced with their burden to the open parlor door where Miss Ophelia still sat knitting. St. Clair had turned into a café to look over an evening paper. As he was reading, an affray arose between two gentlemen in the room, who were both partially intoxicated. St. Clair and one or two others made an effort to separate them, and St. Clair received a fatal stab in the side with a bowie-knife, which he was attempting to wrest from one of them. The house was full of cries and lamentations, shrieks and screams, servants frantically tearing their hair, throwing themselves on the ground, or running distractedly about, lamenting. Tom and Miss Ophelia alone seemed to have any presence of mind, for Marie was in strong, hysteric convulsions. At Miss Ophelia's direction one of the lounges in the parlor was hastily prepared, and the bleeding form laid upon it. St. Clair had fainted through pain and loss of blood, but as Miss Ophelia applied restoratives, he revived, opened his eyes, looked fixedly on them, looked earnestly around the room, his eyes traveling wistfully over every object, and finally they rested on his mother's picture. The physician now arrived and made his examination. It was evident, from the expression of his face, that there was no hope. But he applied himself to dressing the wound, and he and Miss Ophelia and Tom proceeded composedly with this work, amid the lamentations and sobs and cries of the affrighted servants, who had clustered about the doors and windows of the veranda. Now, said the physician, we must turn all these creatures out. All depends on his being kept quiet. St. Clair opened his eyes, and looked fixedly on the distressed beings whom Miss Ophelia and the doctor were trying to urge from the apartment. Poor creatures, he said, and an expression of bitter self-reproach passed over his face. Adolph absolutely refused to go. Terror had deprived him of all presence of mind. He threw himself along the floor, and nothing could persuade him to rise. The rest yielded to Miss Ophelia's urgent representations that their master's safety depended on their stillness and obedience. St. Clair could say but little. He lay with his eyes shut, but it was evident that he wrestled with bitter thoughts. After a while he laid his hand on Tom's, who was kneeling beside him, and said, "'Tom, poor fellow!' "'What, Massa?' said Tom earnestly. "'I am dying,' said St. Clair, pressing his hand. "'Pray!' "'If you would like a clergyman,' said the physician. St. Clair hastily shook his head, and said again to Tom more earnestly, "'Pray!' And Tom did pray, with all his mind and strength, for the soul that was passing, the soul that seemed looking so steadily and mournfully from those large melancholy blue eyes. It was literally prayer offered with strong crying and tears. When Tom ceased to speak, St. Clair reached out and took his hand, looking earnestly at him, but saying nothing. He closed his eyes, but still retained his hold, for, in the gates of eternity, the black hand and the white hand hold each other with an equal clasp. He murmured softly to himself, at broken intervals, Recordare Jesu pie, ne me perdas illa die, querens me sedisti lasus. It was evident that the words he had been singing that evening were passing through his mind, words of entreaty addressed to infinite pity. His lips moved at intervals, as parts of the hymn fell brokenly from them. "'His mind is wandering,' said the doctor. "'No, it is coming home, at last,' said St. Clair energetically. "'At last, at last!' The effort of speaking exhausted him. The sinking paleness of death fell on him, but with it there fell, as if shed from the wings of some pitying spirit, a beautiful expression of peace, like that of a weary child who sleeps. So he lay for a few moments. They saw that the mighty hand was on him. Just before the spirit parted he opened his eyes, with a sudden light, as of joy and recognition, and said, Mother! And then he was gone. End of chapter 28